Today I thought I would talk about the role of the French Resistance during World War II in this video, which has been sponsored by our friends at The Great Courses Plus. More of them later. Now, um, I, in my youthful naivety, did buy into the idea that the French uh, Resistance was one big organised unit of brave Gallic souls who, who, as one united body, resisted the, French, the German occupation of France all the way through the war. And I was wrong. But I, I, I'd been sold a mythology, sold a mythology largely by the French. I do remember in my youth, uh, I went to uh, France on holiday with my family loads of times when I was a little boy, and I can remember that um, we went to a tank museum, because, well, you, know, you would, wouldn't you? It's got loads of tanks in it. And how much my father laughed at a video that was playing on a loop. I didn't completely understand it, but his French was better than mine. Um, it showed loads of pictures of a parade of tanks in front of a big clapping audience, and there was a history of World War II uh, playing. Um, and uh, to paraphrase, it went something like this. Uh, in order to liberate France from the dastardly Germans, the French invaded Germany, but having then found that she had been betrayed by her ghastly allies, uh, she was then forced to withdraw from uh, Germany. Uh, but she came up with a master plan, which was to go back across the Channel to uh, Britain or somewhere like that, and then remass and then come back and liberate Europe. And that's what they did, uh, apparently. And, uh, well, it seems to work, so well done, France. And I can remember looking at uh, this parade of tanks and thinking, wow, that French tank looks remarkably, that looks remarkably like a Sherman. It really, I knew my tanks, even as a little boy. That looks remarkably like, oh no, no, it's not a Sherman, no, because it's got French markings on it. Oh, that looks like an M3 half to, oh no, no, French again, I can see the marking. Oh, that looks like a British, uh, oh no, no, French markings again, all these, French tanks were being paraded, these French World War II tanks. And I remember my family used to marvel at the number of bronze statues there are in France of, of French World War II generals, as though they did anything of any significance. It's, it's, it's bizarre. But de Gaulle quite knowingly and deliberately, not just de Gaulle, but de Gaulle particularly, quite knowingly and deliberately fostered this myth of France liberating herself. Um, against their better judgment, possibly, the Allied High Command uh, were persuaded by de Gaulle to let him walk into the just liberated Paris as though he had liberated it uh, ahead of the Allied forces. And there he made a speech, um, one which, um, as he would on so many other occasions, stung the Allies with its ingratitude. He said, and I, I quote, although of course I quote in translation, Paris liberated, liberated by her own efforts, liberated by her people, with the help of the armies of France, with the help of all France, that is France in combat, the one France, the true France, eternal France. Yeah, right. Thanks to Gaulle, uh, we believe you. Um, but in fact, De Gaulle didn't organise the French Resistance. In fact, um, the French Resistance was being organised by the British and they didn't even tell him, they didn't let him in on any of their secrets because French security was notoriously lax. If you told the French, then the secret would be out pretty quickly. The British actually had managed to insert 90 what they called circuits of F section, I think the F stands for France, of SOE, Special Operation Executive um, agents in France. Uh, SOE was later to become MI6, you know, James Bond and all that. Well, um, they managed to get the, these, these circuits set up within France and they would teach the locals to listen out for certain code words, um, code phrases that were quite surreal, real, you know, les singes dans son lazare stuff, um, and these would be broadcast after the news on the BBC. Now, you may be thinking, oh yeah, yeah, right, you know, you Lloyd, with your notorious pro-British bias, of course you're saying that the French resistance was organised by the British. You would say that, wouldn't you? Well, ah, actually, let's be fair to the French here. The French couldn't organise the French resistance. They didn't have... Well, let me describe some of the uh, problems they had. France is really quite big. The entire population can't just take to the hills and hide behind bushes. Um, there are not enough bushes, not enough hills, and too many people in France. Um, the Germans, um, later on, uh, recruited men of fighting age to work in labour camps. So when, uh, in 1944, the Jedbra teams dropped in uh, to organise these, these recruited uh, gangs of men that were going to do the job, they were quite disappointed to find out that they had loads of 15-year-old boys and out-of-condition 
broken down middle-aged guys. So where are all the guys in between? They were mostly uh, working in labor camps doing whatever the Germans told them to do. Um, so the French didn't have the manpower. The French didn't have the mass communication ability because all these these little groups of, of resistance all around France, how were they to communicate with each other? They couldn't use the mass media. The BBC could broadcast to the whole of France, but th they couldn't take over a broadcasting station. If they, if they used the mass media, they would very quickly be caught and killed. So they couldn't actually coordinate in that way. And what were they going to coordinate with? You see, if you just do some act of, of, of vandalism uh, in the name of of the re resistance. It doesn't really do a lot. So you, you blow up a load of uh, machines in the local factory. Okay, well, what have you achieved? You've taken a great risk. You've put a load of factory workers out of work. They're going to really like you. When your family, if your family finds out that you took that risk, then they'll be thinking, you, you idiot, we could have lost you. And what's more, if you were caught, the Germans in reprisals would have killed all of us. So your family now hates you and if anyone outside your family finds what they're going to they're going to be annoyed too because you know the reprisals were you know quite often not just the immediate family but you know everyone in the area and maybe they burn down the village so you put all of us in danger and for what those machines will be replaced or repaired and after a while the factory will be working again what did you achieve you got everyone hating you and you took a tremendous risk what have you actually achieved not a lot but if you had an outside coordination from Britain, coordinating your actions with some really major thing like the Normandy landings, then that's different because if you can get all those cells all around France, all blowing up trains and doing stuff all at the same time, right on the day of the Normandy landings, then that's going to be militarily very, very useful indeed. When your enemy is busy, that's when it's easiest to get away with guerrilla activity. And it's also when that guerrilla activity is most effective. So, um, did they achieve anything of military use? Yes, they also definitely did. Uh, they did so much damage to the railway network that it was uh, that it was operating at thirty percent capacity when the Normandy landing breakout uh, phase was was going on. So that's a great achievement. That made it very difficult for the Germans to move troops around. So difficult, in fact, um, that uh, the Das Reich, uh, for instance, division, one of the elite. Uh, panzer units of, the, of the, the, the German army, it was only three days away from the front, but it took them 17 days to get into action. They were so delayed by bridges being broken, signposts pointing the wrong way, telephone cables being cut and derailed trains and so forth. Uh, the British dropped 70,000 tyre bursters um, uh, to, to puncture the tyres of passing convoys and uh, entire divisions of Germans ran out of puncture repair kits. Um, so yes, that was militarily very useful indeed. And at that moment, they showed what they could do. But the thing is that up until that moment, and even beyond it, they spent most of their time fighting each other. You see, there wasn't one resistance. Instead, there were loads and loads of local commanders who all wanted to be their, you know, their own boss. Um, and didn't want to coordinate with others because you know, they enjoyed being a boss, having their own little private army. Plus, ideologically, all these different splinter cells, they all hated each other because you know, some of them were communists. But don't forget that there are several different kinds of communists who all hated each other. You Trotskyists, you Marxists, you, you Leninists, you, you Stalinists, and so forth. Um, and they all hated each other. And then there were the socialists who, who, again, split into loads of different kinds of socialists. And they all hated each other. And they all hated the communists. And they all hated the de Gaullists because, you know, that's the other lot entirely. They just, oh. So if you are... Uh, in the in in the Maquis, if you are uh, a volunteer in 1943, there's not actually not a lot you can do. You can't coordinate your efforts with the big push with Normandy landings because that's not happening yet. Um, and if you want to get some arms, get some weapons, you could you could steal them off the Germans. That's really amazingly dangerous. However, and there will be horrendous reprisals if a load of arms get stolen off the Germans. They're going to line up a load of presumably innocent people, doesn't matter, and shoot them against a wall. So, um, yeah, maybe, ah, I know, we'll steal weapons off a rival group of of resistance, because that's much safer. There won't be any reprisal, so we won't be universally hated. And then when the war ends, we'll be able to use those arms against the swines. Ha! Yeah, and this continued even when the Allies were dropping in 
uh, supplies after Normandy even, uh, it would still be the case that you had to watch out because as you um, were signaling to an aircraft and watching the, the supply drops, parachutes come down onto your landing zone, which you'd carefully uh, prepared and lit with three beacons, you might be ambushed by another lot of resistance who would then nick all your arms and then perhaps not even use them to fight the Germans but instead hoard them for the day when, when the, the Germans have gone and then you can fight against the de Gaullists or whoever it is. And it's got so bad in fact that Allied High Command coming right from, uh, from Eisenhower decided that they would stop dropping so many arms to the French resistance. Uh, in three months, um, uh, July to September 1944, they dropped 6,000 tons of small arms and explosives. And then after a while they started dropping less because they thought, great, we're gonna liberate a country which will then immediately dis dissolve into a civil war because we'll have so many armed bands who all hate each other that uh, they'll all be at each other's throats and we don't want that. Um, and it seems that they were quite wise because, well, there wasn't a big civil war immediately after World War II in France, but perhaps there could have been. Now, I was going to talk about The Great Courses Plus, so I will, just briefly. Uh, the Great Courses Plus is a huge online website with loads and loads of lectures, generally about half an hour long, in all sorts of subjects. Um, uh, and a lot of them are to do with military history. And if you're watching this video, you're probably into military history. Um, I've been looking at uh, the series of uh, lectures. There are 24 half hour lectures on great military blunders. So if you want to know about, um, you know, Cardigan and the Charge of the Light Brigade, oops, then maybe that's one for you. But now, if you type in www.thegreatcoursesplus.com Com. Don't forget the dot com. Honestly, Lloyd, you had one job. Stroke Lindy Beige, or it's quicker, click on the shortened link in the description to this video. You'll be taken to a landing page, and there you will find waiting for you an offer of one free month's membership. And well, why not take advantage of it? Because it's one free month. And in that time, you can look at a load of lectures. And then at the end of the month, if you, you think, do you know what, I don't think this is for me, or I've seen enough, you can just cancel your subscription and pay nothing. Uh, but don't think that in one month you're going to watch all the lectures because there are far too many of them. You won't stand a hope of seeing everything in one month. Anyway, so The Great Courses Plus, why don't you give them a look if you're into, what well, doesn't have to be history, science, cookery, photography, doesn't matter, whatever it is, eh, give them a look. So now um, the British sent in the Jedbras. The Jedbras were uh, special operations executive uh, agents uh, that were there to lead the French resistance actually as combat units, not as not as uh, information relayers, but actually combat units. So these guys were, uh, they were sent down in uniform and they were armed and they would say, right, we're gonna form units. And typically a JED team found itself uh, in command of about 1500 uh, resistance fighters. And I have read of actions that got up to battalion levels. So, you know, some of the actions were really quite big that they were fighting against the Germans, uh, besieged in, in various garrison towns and so forth. Um, they did have a problem later on when uh, the Allies were going forward so successfully that the um, there was a genuine risk of the irregular troops of the resistance uh, meeting the regular advancing troops of the Allies and there being some horrendous confusion and friendly fire incidents and, some, and so forth. And uh, usually what they would do is just make themselves scarce because you don't want to mix regular and irregular forces. Um, and uh, it did happen that sometimes forces of the Maquis would find themselves trapped between the Germans and the advancing Allies, which wasn't a nice position to be in. Um, now, there were loads of people who were, of course, sort of in favour of the Nazi occupation. There were the milice, for instance, which is only one letter away from the word malice. And these were the secret police who were pro-Vichy, pro-Nazi occupation, who would denounce their fellows, um, sometimes in a spirit of just petty vengeance. Oh, you know that guy over there who was so ungracious when my cow won best in show at the agricultural uh, uh, competition. Well, hey, I'll denounce him to the Gestapo and he won't be laughing now. It seems that there are people out there who really are that petty. And of course, if you think that uh, he's a de Gaullist and you're a communist, that's another reason for denouncing him. Uh, even though you may think that they're both pro-French, yeah, yeah, these rivalries were so intense that there were people who would take advantage of the situation to harm their fellows. Now, 
The Maquis, of course, uh, when the Germans had been ejected from an area, were often quite keen to round up all the people they think had been collaborators and without trial quite often execute them. They killed a lot. They killed about 30,000 Frenchmen this way, which shockingly is about the same number that the Nazis killed during the whole of the French occupation. So it seems, you know, based on that, that maybe there was a genuine risk of civil war in France. And uh, so perhaps Eisenhower and the British uh, Allied High Command uh, did a wise thing in stopping uh, the arm arming of the, the Maquis, the resistance. There was never one unified resistance. Um, and uh, in fact, there were so many organizations that they were known uh, uh, to the SOE uh, HQ as the, the alphabetical resistance. And here, here are just a few of the, the organizations that called themselves the French resistance during World War II. This is just a few, this is just a few samples. They all have their own little initialisms. There were so many of them and they were not coordinated, but it does turn out that if you've got a large number of uh, uncoordinated rival groups who are doing incredibly petty things, like one of the things the British had to stop them doing was, could you please stop holding up tobacconists, but we can hold up tobacconists, we can get lots of cigarettes. Yes, yes, but it's not really very good for the for the war effort, is it? Just holding up a tobacconist. Could you please just, you know, can we, can we fight the Germans? Can we do that? Um, yes, but you can make them a very effective fighting unit if you get them all to do something of military use all at the same time, just when you make the big push with your conventional forces. And for that to happen, you need an external organizing force. The French couldn't have organized that. The only people in a position to do it were the British. Lindy Bear!